Let's pray. Wonder working, all loving, show enough, ain't nobody like you, God. We welcome you into this place. We welcome you into this space. We invite you to let Rachel decrease so that you will increase. We invite you, Jesus, to send us the word of life, the word of hope that will save, that will heal, that will strengthen, that will encourage, that will renew, that will restore. Most of all, that would we invigorate us so that we don't leave here the same way we came. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, can y'all do me a solid? Can you open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew again? This time, I need you to go to chapter 14. I'm going to read nine verses. I'm going to read verses 13 through 21. Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. When you have that, feel free to say amen. amen. Matthew chapter 14, I will be reading verses 13 through 21 from the New King James Version. Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21 from the New King James Version. Won't you listen for the word of God? When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And Jesus, and when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. Mm -hmm. He said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. The message for us today is simply one word, moved. So, this particular passage of scripture is a very interesting passage of scripture. Can, can y'all indulge me? Um, I'd like to suggest that Jesus was moved and then he was moved and then he was moved and then he was moved. And every time that Jesus was moved, he acted in such a way that the situation that moved him changed. Um, the first thing that moved Jesus was probably something that would have moved me and you too. He heard the news that John the Baptist had been beheaded. He was moved. That moved him. That touched him. That got him. Um, it, it touched him and it, and it got him and, and, and it messed with his mind and it messed with his spirit. I, I believe it messed with his mind and it messed with his spirit for a couple of reasons. First of all, they were related. John the Baptist was Jesus's cousin. When's the last time you heard that a family member passed and you weren't moved, that you weren't concerned, that it didn't trip you up, that it didn't make it a little more challenging for you to go about your daily life like you had been going about it. He was moved because he heard that John the Baptist 
died. He was moved because he heard that John the Baptist died because there were people in power who were trying to shut down the message of God to repent and get right with God. He was moved not just because John was killed, but he was moved because John was killed so that the ministry of God would die. That ought to move. Everybody, I, I mean, when, when you discover that somebody tries to shut somebody down, tries to shut somebody out, tries to stop somebody, tries to crush them just because they are trying to get folk to get closer to God, that ought to move you. It, 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 it ought to touch your heart, it ought to touch your mind, and it ought to mess with you enough that you just might want to get a little bit more closer to the God who creates everything. He, he's moved enough that he takes time to connect with the God of all creation. He's moved enough that he decides that he has to spend some one-on-one -on -one quality time with God, the father, the mother, the creator, the one who runs it all. Have you ever been so touched and so concerned by news that you received that you just had to get close to Jesus? That, 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 that you needed a little more Jesus, that, that, that you need a little more access to God. Maybe you couldn't understand why it happened. Maybe you couldn't understand why it happened to the one that it happened to. And, and since you couldn't make any sense of it, the one thing that you knew to do was to go to God because you figured if you went to God, God can handle it and God can handle you. When you moved, because your heart is breaking. When you're moved because you're sad, it makes sense that you will go to God, right? Um, but the crowd who recognized in Jesus a capacity to be moved with compassion, to act and to do miraculous things, wasn't moved by Jesus's movement. Um, here's a message for you. I hate to burst your bubble. If people can tell that God has God's hands on you, if people can tell that some kind of way you have a capacity to get through stuff that other folk can't get through, if people can tell that God might listen to you, don't be surprised if they don't respect your need for personal space and personal time. They didn't respect Jesus's. Did, did y'all hear what the scripture said? The scripture said Jesus heard it. That was the news that John the Baptist had died and it moved him. He was touched and he had to go spend some quality time with God. So he went up on the mountain to spend quality time with God. But do y'all know what the multitude did? The multitude just followed Jesus up the mountain. The, the multitude did not respect. So, so, so if you're wondering why you are going through and you're trying to spend time in devotion and in prayer and, and you're trying to get close to God, you, 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 got, you got your encouraging music playlist and I know all of it ain't Christian, don't play. <laughs> Uh, you, 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 you got all the stuff you put up on your room, all the, all the encouraging sayings, sayings, and all of them are not scripture. Don't play, I know. Um, the colors that soothe you, all the things that help encourage you, and you are surrounding yourself with all of that stuff, and you trying to be in your own space. And if you got kids, you know the first thing that's going to happen. And it don't matter if your kids are grown. And it sure doesn't matter if they got kids of their own, because if they got kids knocking on their door while they're trying to get close to God, do you not think that they 
ain't going to knock on your door while you trying to get close to God. And while all of us are trying to get close to God and have folk knocking on our door, guess what God is doing? Even as somebody is knocking on our door for us to minister to them, God is ministering to us. God is saying to us, I hear you. I see you. I understand your pain. I understand your confusion. And I give you the time that you need to be right with me, to be strengthened by me so that you can turn and be moved by the folk who ain't moved by you. I'm going to just let us sit with that for a moment. God really does expect us to be moved by compassion to act on behalf of others, even when God is moved by compassion to act on behalf of us. Because that's what Jesus did and it's what Jesus does. Watch it, watch it. He doesn't just do it once. He really doesn't be, because he's moved by the fact that, that the crowd is so full of hurt and pain and shame and confusion that they can't be moved by the fact that he is also filled with hurt and shame and confusion, but he's able to go to God and be renewed and be strengthened and be encouraged so much so that he can come away from his time with God and be moved. And he begins to heal, and then he heals, 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 and then night falls, and everybody's hungry. And the disciples panic. Jesus, what we gonna do now? We got all these people. Can't you just tell them to go away? They are moved by fear that the crowd might come for them if the crowd doesn't get something to eat. And so they go to Jesus. It makes sense they go to Jesus. When you're scared, you ought to go to Jesus. When you're confused, you ought to go to Jesus. When you're not sure how to handle the situation, you ought to go to Jesus. It makes sense that they go to Jesus. But what's interesting about Jesus is Jesus, who has turned to the multitude, now turns to the 12. He's moved with compassion for the very folk who ain't moved with compassion for the other folk. And watch what Jesus does. Jesus goes, yeah, I'm not about to do that. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to let me encourage you. I need you to let me speak life to you. I need you to let me show you that even that which you have that you know ain't enough for you, can be enough for more than you. You feed them. We ain't got nothing, Jesus. We ain't got nothing, Jesus. Uh, we, we, we got like five fish and two little pieces of bread. That ain't enough for one of us to eat lunch. Jesus, we can't, mm -mm, that ain't gonna work. And Jesus says, give it to me. Thank you, God, for providing when we thought that there were no provisions available. And then he begins to hand it to the 12. And he tells the 12 to hand it to the multitude. By the way, the number 5,000 is only the men. If one man came with one wife and one man, wife came with two children, that's real conservative for the time period, by the way. That, that means we're talking about, there could have conceivably been somewhere like 1,500 folk. That's conservatively. Were fed 
with five fish and two loaves of bread. I ain't gonna talk to y'all, I'm gonna talk to them. So the five fish were like five fish sticks. And the two loaves of bread were like two crackers. Five fish sticks and two crackers gonna fill you up. No, mm -mm. okay, I ain't gonna talk to y'all. Mm -mm. I'm, I'm just gonna talk to the mothers. So, so it, it, it was like they gave you catfish nuggets and two pieces of hot water cornbread, not the big pieces of hot water cornbread, but the little pieces of hot water cornbread. And we ain't talking about big catfish nuggets. We, we talking about little bitty catfish nuggets. And, 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 and that ain't really enough of a meal for one person. It's just not. It's just not. That's what they had. And Jesus took what wasn't enough for one person and it not only fed about 1,500 people, they were satisfied. They were full. But wait, it didn't stop there. There were leftovers. <laughs> Watch this, watch this. When you think you are full and you can't pray anymore, when you can't read the scripture and understand anything anymore, when somebody knocks on your door and you don't have yet another good word to encourage, if you take your lack of resources to God, God can take what you think is nothing and do more than something with it. God can take what you have considered as invaluable and unuseful, and God can use it to bless you so that you can bless them, so they 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 can bless them. And when God is done, there's still no blessing left over for everybody else. But it all begins with whether or not you and I can be moved. But watch this. God isn't necessarily asking us to be moved by the other. God is asking us to be moved by a God who is moved by everybody. God's not asking any of us to do more than what God asks of God's self. And God never asks us to move beyond our capacity to move. It's important for you to hear that because I can't have y'all going out to church. So the pastor just told me that when I didn't have any resources, I didn't have anything left, I was supposed to give what I didn't have. That ain't what I said. And I ain't about to let you put that on me. What I said is, when you think you have nothing left, take what you don't have to God and let God handle it. If you give what you don't have as well as what you do have to God, God will take what you give and God will use your gift to prove to you that your nothing can become something and that nothing that God asks you to do is beyond your capacity to do. Seriously, it means there's some folk we got to forgive. It also means there's some folk we got to no longer allow access to our lives. Forgiving somebody does not mean that I forgive you and our relationship is the same as it was before whatever messed up caused the need for me to forgive you. Forgiving just means you no longer have power and I no longer have power to mess with either of our spirits. 
I refuse to allow what happened to wear me down. And if in my forgiving, I no longer have the capacity to look you in the face and hear your voice, cause I ain't there yet, then that means I forgave you and I'm setting you free. Now, some of y'all gonna be, that ain't forgiveness. How you know, have you tried it? Cause it sure ain't forgiveness if you force yourself into the same space and place as somebody else. And every time you in their face and you in their place, you're gonna see, Lord, what you need to do is you need to get them out of my face. Cause if you don't get them out of my face and if somebody don't get them out of my face, we gonna have an issue. You ain't forgive nobody. If you're trying to force yourself to be in the same space and place as somebody so that you can forgive them, but all the time that you're in the space and the place, you doing get them God prayers, you did not forgive. And if you are not at a space and a place where you can be in the same space with folk who have hurt and harmed you without praying, get them God prayers, then you need to do something different. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, if you allow God access to what you think is not enough, just your desire to say, I forgive is enough if you give it to God. If you give your desire to forgive, to God, God will take your desire and build from your desire true forgiveness. But if you try to do all this forgiveness stuff on your own, you gonna fail. You know why you gonna fail? God ain't stupid. God put in us the instinct to protect ourselves from hurt and harm. The reason why forgiveness doesn't come easy is because what is triggered in us is a self-protective something that goes, they gonna hurt me again, 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 they gonna hurt me again. If you want to truly be able to forgive, you gotta give the desire to forgive to God and let God use your desire to do what you can't do on your own and you will be moved and you will find yourself forgiving the very person and the very thing that you thought was unforgivable. Look church, if God in Jesus Christ can be moved in the midst of his suffering and his fear and his confusion and his pain, not once, but twice, all within the same situation. If God can be moved to turn to you and I, when God knows every now and again, we gonna turn our back on God. If God can be moved like that, then certainly you and I can be moved too. Especially if we say to God, God, I wanna be moved. It's hard to move, but I wanna be moved. It's hard to turn to somebody else when I'm hurting myself, but I wanna be moved. I wanna be like you, I wanna live like you. I want you to be proud of me. I want you to tell the angels in heaven that I am yours. I want to be moved, but moving is hard. So if God, if you would just move me, I'll move. If you give God your desire, God will build on your desire and you will discover yourself moving just like the 12 did. And your movement just might move somebody else. This is the word of God for the people of God. All thanks and praise be to God.